Maybe, maybe we can just give it a minute and then uh, we can start with the introduction. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. As you probably know, a couple days ago was Star Wars Day. May the 4th be with you. And now the mission of our next speaker is to bring you over to the dark side and show you how to use the force, presumably the electroweak force, that is. Of course, I'm only joking. This will be nothing like Star Wars. This will be much more like Ghostbusters. When you have little things that go bump in the dark, who are you gonna call? A subatomic physicist, of course, who will show up with his proton pack and a truck full of detector equipment. Now we know you would not trust just anyone to deal with your haunted basement. So we assure you this Ghostbuster is highly qualified. Professor Juan Collar obtained his PhD at the University of South Carolina in 1992. He was a fellow of the Fondation Robert Schumann at the University of Paris from 1993 to 1995, fellow of the Experimental Physics Division at CERN from 96 to 98, and a Marie Curie fellow again at the University of Paris from 98 to 2001. He arrived at the University of Chicago in 2001 and has been in his, in his present position since 2014 as a professor in the Department of Physics, the Enrico Fermi Institute, and the Kavli Institute for Cosmological Physics. He has worked, as I have, his entire career in searches for exotic ghost-like particles and processes. So without further ado, our Ghostbuster Professor Collar will now talk to us about nuclear recoils. Thank you. I hope I'm on mute. Yes, uh, let me share my screen. And uh, well, thanks for having me tonight. It's a, it's a great honor. Um, let me see if I can do this right. I'm not the best at Zoom. Uh, can you see my full screen now? Uh, anybody? Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Excellent. Thank you. So um, you may be wondering, those of you who took the time to look at the title of my talk, if, uh, you know, what is this thing nuclear recoil? It sounds too specific. I'm, I'm going to tell you tonight about uh, a type of radiation interaction. And that, that, that could be pretty arid for sure. But uh, in reality, what I want to tell you about is that about the industry that has grown around this particular way in which particles, microscopic subatomic particles decide to interact sometimes. Uh, you, you see that there's been a, essentially an explosion of interest, even though uh, the process, the mechanism of interaction is sort of a, an old shoe. I'm going to start with the history, the very first measurements of this uh, process. And uh, already back then, you could see that they, they, they led themselves to some significant discoveries, the discovery of the neutron. But before I, I go, uh, but before I, I go into that, um, uh, uh, sorry, I just heard recording stopped. So I'm, I'm letting, the, uh, uh, letting the panelists uh, know that uh, the recording seems to be stopped on this end. Um, so before I go into that, uh, let me explain this image that you have in front of, of you. This is actually um, 
This is actually uh, uh, what happens inside of a bubble chamber, and I'll describe this object in more detail in a few minutes. This is what happens when a nuclear recoil takes place. It produces a tiny little bubble. And this is happening uh, essentially two kilometers underground in Sudbury in Canada, in Ontario, uh, where we run uh, an enormous battery of such experiments looking for, well, among other things, uh, among other things, this type of this type of interaction, this uh, these nuclear recoils. It is an stereoscopic image, of course, and th that's why you have two images. And uh, it's a tiny little thing, as you can see in there. These uh, shadows there, we'll be we'll be talking about them. These are microphones that allow us actually to listen to the sound emitted by these expanding bubbles. And uh, in the process, we learn things about the the the, the type of interaction that took place. It's, it's kind of an interesting technique. So most of uh, the radiation around us, and we're going to be talking about their sources, uh, chooses to interact via uh, what we call ionization. Ionization is just essentially as a particle goes, it will, it will push out electrons out of uh, its path. And uh, what it takes for that is mainly that the particle should be charged. It is the charge of the particle that essentially produces this repulsion and this displacement of electrons along the wake or trajectory of the particle. Uh, we have a name for those electrons that are, that are kicked out of the way. We call them delta electrons. You can see it here. Um, uh, but uh, as I said, it, it, it typically requires that the particle should be charged. There's an exception to that, which is photons. Photons, uh, gamma rays, X-rays, they're all the same thing. And they are packages of uh, electromagnetic energy and therefore, by their own nature, they're very prone to coupling, as we say, with electrons. So they, they do this naturally, even though they're neutral, okay, the, these photons. As you can see, uh, it described here in the indirect ionization. That's what we call it. Uh, hold on one second. Let me close this. Um, I, I have a floating Zoom thing that was distracting me. I just closed it. Um, so... Um, I'm about to show you an image. This image is here. I need to explain what they're from. They, they come from one of the earliest types of, of uh, detector uh, that allows us to image uh, particles or image the track of particles, the, the, the wake of these particles I spoke about. And it's the cloud chamber. It's, it's pretty ancient. These are black and white photographs for a reason. And uh, this one here is actually particularly beautiful. I find you can see a sort of a dandelion structure there. That's what happens when alpha particles, charged particles, uh, um, uh, uh, are, are, are emitted inside the cloud chamber. Along their trajectory, they produce ionization, which produces a sort of a snowball effect, uh, uh, giving rise to clouds, uh, essentially the condensation of supersaturated gas into uh, along the paths. And we get to see them, okay? The cloud chambers were exploited, of course, uh, extensively in the early days uh, when we didn't have anything else to uh, use for imaging. And these old pictures are, however, very uh, representative of what I was trying to say. You can, you can see charged particles, electrons, alphas, gammas producing electrons uh, along their, their, their path. You can see them producing uh, these uh, delta electrons, these little wiggly trajectories that you see there. Okay, so that, that's what most types of radiation produce. Ionization, we, you heard the term ionizing radiation before. Now, what is left for a neutral particle to do? I mean, we do know that some particles are not charged. I spoke about the exception, the photon that can do this number of ionizing indirectly. But what about, for instance, neutrons? Now with the privilege of hindsight, we know that some fundamental particles like the neutron carry no charge. Uh, this gentleman here, uh, Sir James Chadwick, uh, led a complicated life. He uh, he came from a very from very modest beginnings, a uh, very humble, poor family. He was a smart kid that ended up uh, uh, on a scholarship in Berlin, uh, with the bad luck of this being taking place right right as the First World War started. He ended up spending four years, some vacations, four years in uh, as a prisoner. If you read his biography, you will see that he managed, even while a prisoner of war, he managed to convince the friendly uh, guards to allow them to form a science club. And 
he actually performed some really interesting uh, experiments using radioactive toothpaste, which is some, it was a thing back then. But anyway, after all this was over, he came back home and he, um, he uh, went back to study under uh, Rutherford. Rutherford uh, had performed uh, a classic experiment immediately before uh, that essentially revealed the structure of atoms the way we know them nowadays as a heavy nucleus or a nucleus con con containing protons, neutrons, etc. And outside in orbitals or clouds, uh, uh, the electrons. Before that, before his experiment, uh, the, the picture was entirely different. Uh, there was still a, a pending riddle, a mystery, which was a chemist knew, uh, had known for a while, that if you look at the two lightest uh, elements we know about, helium and hydrogen, helium is much more massive, four times more massive than hydrogen. And the question was why? Because the charge of helium is just two times that of, um, uh, or the, 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 the helium nucleus is just two times that of, uh, of hydrogen. So people were still hypothesizing, going back to all models of the atom saying, well, maybe there's two more protons, but they are entangled as we just heard before with uh, electrons and therefore they are neutralized or neutral in charge. That we know is wrong. We, we nowadays know that there are two neutrons, two truly neutral particles in there. Um, so uh, Rutherford spent more than a decade after listening to his thesis advisor uh, postulate the existence of these neutrons, I mean, Rutherford was bold enough to say maybe that's what it is. Uh, actually, with the idea in mind of measuring uh, or, or demonstrating their existence. When I see this picture of, their, of his lab at the time, I feel much better about my own these days. But to cut a long story short, he performed uh, 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 measurements over these 12 years, eventually um, leading to the realization that uh, these neutrons do exist and what they produce, what was measured without going into too much of uh, de details here is uh, nuclear recoils. They essentially can kick in a block of paraffin in this case, they can give a push to a proton close to the surface, external surface of this block and that what was detected. Uh, in order to do so, I mean, the, the way that these experiments were done were very smart in the sense that I'm about to show you the original paper, there are no equations in it. It's, uh, and, and, and I clipped it, but this is about half of the length of the paper. It's just a reduction ad absurdum based on uh, replacing this paraffin by all the materials that you can see here in his toolbox. And as you can see, he says, it, he says rather clearly here, and they appear to be in each case recoil atoms of the elements, what was ejected and measured by this uh, apparatus on the right. Here's a little jab to the Jolie Curiots at the th time in a class we teach, we actually go into the math and show all of the things that the other scientists were doing wrong in trying to interpret these mystery emanations as something else. They thought they were very high energy gammas. It was totally wrong. But uh, uh, Chadwick by measuring nuclear recoils, the protons ejected or kicked out uh, 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 of the path from, by, uh, from these neutrons, um, he, he demonstrated the, the existence of, of the neutron. Uh, a little aside, uh, I'm going, as a little aside, I should point out what three short months can do for the confidence of a scientist. Uh, this is the original paper, as I mentioned, uh, February of 32, possible existence of a neutron. And three months later, we have the existence of a neutron. And the paper is pretty much the same thing. I don't know if they had copy paste back then, but uh, uh, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of phrases in common that you can see immediately. So to recap, what is then a, a nuclear recoil? It is pretty much what happens when you have the, uh, the break shot in a game of billiards or pools, or I don't, I don't know how you call it in Canada. Perhaps the British influence leads you to call it uh, 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 snooker. But uh, it, when you open the, the game, uh, essentially you have a projectile that would be the, this white ball here striking uh, in our case a nucleus at rest and what happens as you know is that there's an immediate rapid dispersion of energy very catastrophic okay this is nothing like what I showed you before I'm going to go back a few slides because perhaps I forgot to mention these scales here this, this, these ranges are, are long 
you see things here of the order of one centimeter for the trajectories of these uh, delta electrons uh, that are dispersed or are generated by ionizing radiation. Here we have an entirely different kind of game. Uh, this is a simulation from a package we use in our field often, where uh, a particle came and struck an iodine uh, nucleus, in this case in a compound that we use in the bubble chambers, I'll show you later on, and imparted, gave, gave this nucleus just 10 kV of energy. kV, I'll use the unit later on, it's, it's not much at all, okay? And uh, uh, you can see the, the in red the range or the trajectory of the primary recoil that would be the first ball struck here and then along its wake you can see that it's displacing immediately many other nuclei okay secondary recoils as we call them and the important thing to keep in mind here is the scale uh, this is not centimeters this is amstroms okay 10 to the minus 10 meters this is just a, a few tens of nanometers so the energies here are really concentrated if you were to give the same 10 kV of energy to an electron uh, an ionizing particle, it would actually fly a distance a hundred times longer than this, apples to apples comparison, uh, in order to disperse its energy. So what's characteristic about nuclear recoils is how catastrophically dense the energy deposition can be. An example of that is, well, I have two examples of that. One is if you were able to measure the local temperature at this point of interaction in this area, uh, we cannot do that, but we can actually calculate it the temperature being a measure of disorder, you would end up with an effective temperature of the order of thousands and tens of thousands of degrees. That's how much disorder is created by a nuclear recoil. Um, another example a bit more sobering is, uh, you have heard of neutron bombs. Uh, the, whenever you have this happen nearby your DNA, one of these, uh, the probability of producing a double uh, irreparable double uh, strand break in your DNA, something that cannot be repaired by enzymes, um, is actually very high. And then this can lead to mutations, uh, apoptosis of the cell, etc. So, so this is actually a mechanism. Nuclear recalls are, are highly dangerous. In radiation protection, we assign a quality factor uh, to different types of radiation and ionizing radiations have a quality factor of one, electrons, gammas, etc. Neutrons uh, being able to produce nuclear recoils give you a, a, a quality factor of 20. So the probability of something bad happening to your cells is 20 times higher, okay? So you get a feeling for how special nuclear recoils are. Meanwhile, in the astronomy department, um, looking at my clock here, right around the same time, this uh, <laughs> slightly unhappy gentleman, uh, Fritz Zwicky, who otherwise led a very distinguished career as a professor in Caltech, uh, Swiss in origin, but uh, he, he made his uh, life uh, and career in, in Caltech, um, made the mistake of writing a paper in the German, uh, the original was in, in German, uh, where he uh, made observations of a cluster of galaxies, the coma cluster, and he used something that physicists like to use very often called the Virial Theorem. The Virial Theorem allows you to relate the average kinetic energy of galaxies in a cluster in this case, which he could measure uh, with the average gravitational potential energy. The energy that is there by reason or coming from the, the gravitational pull of the mass that is present. And he, he couldn't make ends meet. He came up with the conclusion that there were 500 times more mass uh, than what the eye could meet, but was in the form of visible uh, matter, okay? The kind that emits light or uh, absorbs light. So he came up with the term Dunkel Materie. I don't speak German, uh, I apologize, which these days we call dark matter. Soon after, uh, well, in contrast to the previous paper I showed you from Chadwick, he wrote immediately after, a few months later, another paper in English this time, and he avoided the term completely. And the reason is the following. The reason is that in this very famous photograph, he is describing to the, uh, to the, photo well, to the, to the interviewer, he's describing the concept of spherical bastards, referring to his colleagues at the time. And a spherical bastard is one that it remains a bastard regardless of the vantage point from which you observe it. 
So uh, to cut a long story short, this idea was deemed crazy. Uh, the indication arrived thanks to Vera Rubin and her colleagues, uh, another famous astronomer who created a catalog. This is what the astronomers call them, a catalog of galaxies caught, galaxies much like ours, a spiral galaxies, but caught from our point of view uh, as standing like this, seen from the side. Then with a, a spectrometer, uh, they were able to select the light coming from different distances from what we call the bulge, the center of these galaxies has a little bulge and then a disk, visible disk. And then with a little slit and, you know, let's not go into the apparatus, but you can imagine you can, by placing a little slit and moving it to the right and then to the left, you can actually measure the speed the, the rotational speed at different distances from the center of the galaxy. And that's done using the, the Doppler effect, which we are all familiar with, the high pitch uh, sound of a siren as it comes, the ambulance comes towards you and then lower pitch as it goes far away or, or passes you. That, that is the Doppler, Doppler effect affecting acoustic waves for, for light waves, for uh electromagnetic radiation what that does is it changes the color of the light towards the red or towards the blue depending on if the moving object the emitter of light in this case is moving towards or away from you so by by measuring the doppler effect in this way they were able to measure those distances and lo and behold what they found out was very surprising this is what was suspected this is the velocity rotational speed as a function of the radius of the galaxy and in those 200 uh, galaxies in the catalog of, or so consistently they found that even though the expectation was that this should go down and that was just based on on looking at the mass that is there the mass that astronomers can can integrate by just just looking at the the the, the, the stars in this picture or, or trying to count them uh, consistently they found that this remained flat these are called flat rotational curves now in order to explain that behavior, you have to invoke a new component, invisible component for the galaxy. We call them galactic halos. Uh, that actually extends, it's not too clear in this, in this plot, but it extends much farther than the visible parts, even the disk, by a factor of 10, actually. And uh, then this halo would hold something, we don't know what yet, but some additional mass that is able to explain this faster speed of rotation. Now, the intuitive way to understand all this is if you've ever had the pleasure of swirling boleadoras around like this gaucho here. I've done that in the living room of an Argentinian friend, and I do not advise you to do this uh, inside a home. Uh, if you've done this, you know or that the faster you twirl them around, the more of a pull, clearly you're going to feel in your hand, the more of a tension in the string. It's the same story here. The tension would be the gravitational force by the mass comprised by the orbit of the stars that were being measured, the, the velocity of which were, was being measured. And clearly there was more mass, more pull, and therefore a faster speed of rotation. And that mass is in the form of this halo. We cannot talk much more about uh, evidence for that matter. Suffice to say that there's been 80 years of uninterrupted evidence. It's not like we sit here and every so often there's uh, something in the science news that says, oh, this contradicts the theory of you know, the, the existence of dark matter. There is something out there that consistently every different kind of measurement we make tells us that there's more mass than meets the eye. There's something dark, something in a form that does not absorb or emit light. One of these uh, evidence uh, pieces of evidence comes from uh, gravitational lensing, the, the warping of space time that is produced by a heavy object, a galaxy, or a cluster of galaxies in front of a, of a source of light uh, and which produces a, a divergence in the, in the uh, per perceived incoming direction of the, of the light rays, okay? In this case, you would perceive the image as, as double. Uh, you might see one of these Einstein crosses that actually uh, uh, multiply the source by a factor of four. So here's another example of gravitational lensing. In this case, it's produced by a, uh, a cluster of galaxies again that is in the foreground and then there's a diffuse distant background of blue galaxies you can see that their images are getting stretched deformed by the gravitational lens when astronomers solve the inverse problem in astronomy which is essentially figuring out what the lens is 
uh, by, by observing the distortions it produces, they can reconstruct the density of matter in the cluster and the spikes would be the galaxies in the cluster, but then there's a broad something else, which is the dark matter uh, holding everything together. Uh, sometimes astronomers have caught two clusters of galaxies going through each other. And when they do that, consistently they see that a lot of conventional matter gets caught in between and essentially due it to its viscosity, if you want, left behind at the, as the clusters uh, uh, cr cross each other. But this mysterious dark matter clings on to the, uh, to the luminous matter and goes through the, through the other uh, cluster as if it wasn't there. So whatever this is, is, is something clearly non, it doesn't collide easily with the other particles. It's very much like a, a fluid that can, uh, you know, go through other materials essentially unperturbed. If this dark matter was charged, we would have seen a behavior completely different from everything I showed you before. We, uh, we would be, uh, you know, the observations would be clearly in tension with uh, what I just showed you. So the, some 40 years ago, the prevalent uh, theory for, for dark matter, uh, we started thinking that maybe it's composed of new elementary particles and then necessarily they have to be neutral, just like the neutron uh, uh, that I'm, you know, just like Chadwick's uh, neutron. So then it, it only, it's only natural to expect that maybe perhaps these neutral particles might interact uh, through nuclear recoils. You start to see how the, the plot thickens. We have funny names for these particles. Uh, we call them uh, weakly interacting massive particles, but essentially we expect them to produce, if they're there in this galactic halo, to produce nuclear recoils, these catastrophic energy, high density energy depositions of order 10 kV. A little bit of energy, but highly concentrated. Then a uh, whole industry of experiments, uh, I'll show you, uh, quantify what I just said in a minute, uh, essentially started uh, 40 years ago and it's, it's just increasing in size and number of, of workers in this area. And the name of the game is essentially what you see here. You have to come up with detectors able to throw out all of the backgrounds, all of the events, all of the interactions of radiation that look like an electron recoil, like like what a gamma would produce or an electron or an alpha, et cetera, what I showed you as ionizing particles, and to keep only the signals that look like a nuclear recoil. What happens when you strike a, a nucleus di directly and it loses energy rapidly? There's been uh, clearly a million possibilities, theoretical possibilities being uh, generated over the years, the last four decades. Uh, some of them, we like them more than others, perhaps wrongly, uh, but we claim that they are non-ad hoc. They come from other sides of physics, having nothing to do with solving the problem of dark matter. And therefore, perhaps because th those theories, those entirely different problems generate particles that might be a, a good solution to this other problem, maybe we find those more appealing. Uh, so those non-ad hoc candidates, but there's no warranty. You, can, you know, this, this is a partial list and the list is enormous. Uh, there's some funny uh, acronyms, acronym, acronyms that you can probably see here and there. Machos, for instance, uh, massive astrophysical compact halo objects. And uh, I cannot help but, uh, you know, doing a little bit of a snarky comment here. While the theorists uh, come up with the funny acronyms, the rest of us have to go to work. And we go to work uh, in places like this. The first thing that it takes to look for dark matter is to go deep underground. And the reason for that is that the deeper you go, the uh, less environmental radiation, in particular that coming from cosmic rays can reach your detectors. On the other hand, these WIMPs, as if, if they exist, being weakly interacting, being able, as you saw in the two clusters going through each other to do that without any interactions, they shouldn't have any problems uh, reaching down there. So, you know, this, this makes your detectors much, much more silent vis-a-vis -vis the backgrounds, uh, allowing you to look for the signals. Uh, as you can see, the, uh, this, uh, this is the Homestake mine, where I spent a, a year as a graduate student in doing one of these experiments. And uh, it, it looks a bit more cozy these days, I'm told. But back then, there were a lot of precautions in trying to keep the, the ceiling where it should be. I, <laughs> Being a non-native speaker, which is something you probably noticed a while ago, I sometimes remember when I first learned uh, a word, 
And uh, I have here, as being in my office, I can show you this thing. I have here my body tag. I don't know if you can see, it says J Coyar from back in the day when I was working there. Um, a body tag that you're supposed to carry on your self-rescue unit. If that sounds like a joke, it's because it's one. Uh, and uh, the miner that was chiseling these this, uh, initials here, uh, I asked him, what is that thing for? And he said, this is in case the ceiling caves in uh, so that we can uh, identify your carcass. I did not know what carcass was, and I remember the moment when I looked it up in the in my apartment later on at night uh, in the dictionary. But uh, anyway, we go to such places to look uh, for these particles. Um, and this is just to illustrate how the muon flux, cosmic muon flux, drops by orders and orders of magnitude as you go deeper and deeper. One of the deepest laboratories in the world, and I'll show you an experiment running there, is, is in Sudbury in Canada. There's only one a little bit deeper by a few hundred feet in China these days. Now, why is it hard to look for dark matter? Because, the, or a complicated business, because there is actually, uh, we live in a radioactive medium, uh, and the sources of radiation are abundant. We, we are radioactive ourselves. The, uh, the fact that uh, our food intake comes from stuff that grew on the surface of the earth makes us essentially indistinguishable from any minerals from the point of view of the radioisotopes that we contain, uranium, thorium, potassium, that uh, are still decaying. They're still around because they're very long lived. And just to uh, put some numbers on what, what I'm saying, uh, uh, an average human, there's essentially 5,000 decays, radioactive decays, the emission of 5,000 particles per second, most of them ionizing uh, um, in, in, in within your bodies. Uh, the air we breathe, as you know, is quite radioactive. There's radon in it coming from some of these chains. And then we have all of the other uh, radiation coming from cosmic rays. This is a, a, you know, an artist's exaggeration of how one of these uh, cascades looks like, but as cosmic rays track the protective layer that the atmosphere forms uh, above us, there, you know, many other particles are generated. And essentially, muons are the only ones that can reach you deep underground. And as you saw, less and less the deeper you go. To give you again some numbers, if you look at the one square meter uh, extending horizontally where we're standing, there's 130 cosmic rays going through that square meter per second. So as I said, a radioactive medium. Uh, there's also human activity has created some loose radioisotopes. We don't have to worry about this much uh, in day-to-day -day life, but, but for the experiments and the detectors we produce, it is actually a source of concern. We get to see these um, man-made radioisotopes in the detectors if you are not careful. Here's my daughters when they were a bit younger with the machine that goes beep, beep also known as Geiger counter. When you turn on a detector like this in, uh, in your laboratory, one made out of sodium iodine, a bit denser than this, you get about a hundred particle interactions per second per kilogram of, of detector mass. The challenge in our field is to build detectors that will be able to isolate one or a few nuclear recoils, specifically nuclear recoils per ton of detector per year. So you see that there's a huge, many orders of magnitude in sensitivity to go. You have to get rid of all of this other radiation before you can hope to see these weakly interacting massive particles. And here's what I was mentioning before. Over the years, the decades, we have come up with a lot of techniques to make these detectors work. And that's been done, of course, at the expense of a lot of workers coming into the field. This is just the experimentalists. If we add phenomenologists and theoreticians, this would be several thousand, uh, uh, probably more than 10,000 workers in, in physics in this area. And many underground laboratories, as you can see, with you know, plenty area down there, Sudbury being one of the best. Now, our sensitivity has gone on through the years. We, we, this is, a, a, this is a, the cross section. The cross section is a $5 word that we like to use in physics to denote uh, the probability of a particle interacting. You can see that the, the units are surface area. We think about it as the, the size of the bullseye that a particle has to go through uh, in order for the reaction to happen. In this case, in order for a nuclear recoil to be produced. And uh, 
to have a, a little bit of perspective, the neutrons that Chadwick used to generate those proton recoils and through reductive al absurdum derive or be convinced that he was looking at neutral particles, uh, they, they had a probability of this order, 10 to the minus 24. In these experiments, we're reaching 10 to the minus 46 in the same units. That tells you how much more sensitive we are. Eventually, we're going to run into a wall. This is versus gear coming from coherent neutrino scattering. I'll be talking about that in a minute. This is the end of the road. This is produced by solar neutrinos, and they give you low energy nuclear recoils, exactly like those you're looking or expecting from the WIMPs. By the time we get there, uh, we won't be able to distinguish one signal from the other, and we'll have to start looking for dark matter elsewhere. Now, today we have a, a limited time, and I don't want to go over my time uh, limit, but uh, uh, there's been many detector technologies developed to address this, specifically to detect these low energy nuclear recoils, sometimes combining more than one channel to read out the, the, the information. Um, today, I'm just going to tell you about one, of course, the one that, <laughs> that I participate in, the best one. <laughs> this, I'm joking, there's very many, as you can imagine, and it's a highly competitive field. But uh, today, I'm just going to tell you about one uh, running at, uh, in Sudbury at Snow Lab. It, it, it consists of a, 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 what we call a bubble chamber, which is, again, one of these old imaging detectors that we essentially revisited the technique in order to use it for this other purpose of seeing nuclear recoils with it. A superheated liquid, which is what's inside a bubble chamber, is actually something you're familiar with. When, when, when you're at home uh, using a frying pan and you accidentally drop some water on the hot oil, that water finds itself suddenly above 100 Celsius, and then it releases, it, 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 is, it, it rapidly goes into the uh, vapor phase due to the high temperature. But for a few milliseconds, it, it's, it's hanging in there. It's still a liquid and it's way above 100 Celsius. And the violence of the, of the explosion tells you how unhappy this water is in having been tricked to remain a liquid when it should be a gas. Uh, we call that a metastable system. Um, so this is actually coincidentally from uh, not Ghostbusters, but Mythbusters, uh, where they were essentially looking into that scenario that may have happened to you where you sometimes put your mug of tea or some other hot liquid in the microwave oven. And then when you retrieve it, it suddenly explodes. This can happen. And you know this is very much what we, are, what we do in bubble chambers in a more controlled manner. Here comes the nuclear recoil. You have you know, essentially an amplification of this tiny little episode of energy deposition because of the latent energy that is stored in the medium, in the superheated liquid. This is the way things happen in a small bubble chamber. This is one of the early ones. And you can see three bubbles appearing at the same time. That's, that's not a WIMP. A WIMP is so weakly interacting that it can go through the earth and give you, if you're lucky enough, one interaction in your detector seeing three so close to each other would be essentially impossible. We know that this is a neutron. We know it's three nuclear recoils produced by a neutron that managed to get in there. So here's uh, Pico 60. Um, um, I don't want to run out of time, so I'm going to skip over some of these, uh, some of these uh, plots. But uh, something we're doing that I mentioned before is we are um, listening to the sound produced by these bubble expansions. And that tells us about a little bit about some types of particles that we cannot discriminate against by just regulating the pressure and temperature of the liquid, which is what we do. Maybe, maybe I should spend a second here. Uh, this is pure thermophysics. This is a, you know, it would take a few minutes to explain this plot, but essentially this is telling you that only particles on the top right quadrant can produce bubbles for the chosen pressure and temperature indicated here and there. And you can see that electrons, ionizing particles are excluded, but alphas and alpha recoils might give you bubbles and they do. And actually we use essentially the same source that Chadwick using his experiment to, to calibrate this detector to produce nuclear recoils in there and understand how it's working. We differentiate between neutrons or, or, or WIMPs, which is of course what we want to detect, and alpha particles by listening to the sound emitted by those bubbles. And you can see that this is essentially the, the sound waves that we register with piezoelectric sensors with fancy microphones uh, along the sides of the chamber. And you can see that the alphas are much more hairy. 
that's just the fact that there's more amplitude contained at high frequencies, okay? And uh, uh, we do know what's producing this is essentially the track of the particles is very different. And for nuclear recoils, because they are so contained, the energy deposition is within a few tens of nanometers, like I showed you before, you produce a single protobubble that expands into a big one along the track of an alpha. An alpha can go a thousand times longer in range. And then on the average, you actually produce four protobubbles. So you have four times the sound emission because each one of them individually is producing the same amount of sound. Pico 500, we have to build a 500 liter chamber now and it's fully funded by the Canada Foundation for Innovation and it's in the works, okay? Now, as I said before, there's no warranty that we're looking in the right spot. Uh, that we started by looking for weakly interacting massive particles that produce nuclear recoils and some of the families of particles I showed with you before might actually interact through different mechanisms and produce different observables. Uh, we like to make these jokes uh, sometimes. There's no warranty for success in what we're trying. And that led some of us uh, who have been working on this field for decades to say, well, with what we learn, can we apply it to some other area? What we learn in looking for nuclear recoils. So there are other neutral particles out there that could be producing nuclear recoils as well. The neutrino is one of them. The neutrino was named as little neutral particle. They chose the Italian intonation of the name uh, to distinguish it precisely from the neutron. This is the gentleman who proposed it, Wolfman Pauli, a rather tortured soul. Uh, and he said, uh, I have done a terrible thing. I have done a terrible thing because I have um, postulated a particle that cannot be detected. The evidence for the neutrino back in the day came from missing energy and missing momentum. I'm showing you here another image uh, from a cloud chamber where you see the recoiling nucleus following a beta decay, the beta or electron being produced. And clearly if you sum these two vectors uh, and you wanted to preserve momentum, you would need to invoke something else, you know, leaving, leaving uh, uh, stage left uh, pointing in the opposite direction. And that would be the neutrino, okay? So it's such observations that led Pauli to postulate this. And he had no hope that this would be ever seen. Clearly it doesn't show up in the cloud, cloud chamber. Um, neutrinos we know are very weakly interacting. In the scale I showed you before of cross-section, they will be at 10 to the minus 40, many, many, you know, orders of magnitude lower than, than uh, you know, uh, the, the cross-sections for, for uh, a neutron interaction, for instance. Uh, uh, here we have uh, Clay Cohen and Fred Rines, Frederick Rines, who years later, it took 20 some years to uh, come up with a smart experiment done right next to a nuclear reactor, a power reactor in uh, Savannah River in, in South Carolina, uh, uh, that eventually demonstrated that neutrinos do exist. This is one of my favorite pictures in physics. I should say a couple of words about it. Uh, if you look at the graffiti, I like it because it reminds you that you should have fun doing what you're doing. On the wall, it says hypothetical particle, hypothetical particle referring at the time to the neutrinos. And then someone came and corrected and said hypnotheoretical particle. And then over there, it says neutrino poltergeist, this mischievous spirits, which is, of course, the, the name of the project. Um, if you Google neutrino detector, this is what shows up. Uh, and then you can read the labels, mightiest neutrino detector, neutrino detector to have huge tanks, gigantic Japanese detector, largest neutrino. They're big things. They're big things because neutrinos are weakly interacting. These detectors uh, aim sometimes to look at the neutrinos coming from the sun, and therefore you need a lot of mass, okay? Um, neutrinos are not easy to catch, in other words. That's why it took 25 years to see them in the first place. A few years ago, we were able to detect them in a new fashion, a new fashion that again had been predicted theoretically 43 years before we finally nailed this. Uh, and we did so with a handheld detector, something very different in size to what I showed you before, using a very intense source of neutrinos at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. This is my grad student, uh, John Scholz, illustrating the concept of the handheld neutrino detector. In reality, that's a lie. He's, the photographer is emitting death threats saying, if you let that thing drop, 
<laughs> but uh, he's he's holding it for dear life and that's that's what it took this 14 kilogram uh, device and as you would have guessed we did so by looking for the nuclear recoils produced by the neutrinos as you can see in this image here uh, in this material, a scintillator that we use, you generate light, and that's what this electronia, electronic eye of sorts, this photomultiplier, is detecting. What's curious about this mechanism, we call it SEVENS, short for Coherent Elastic Neutrino Nucleus Scattering, which is a mouthful. SEVENS has the largest neutrino cross-section, the largest probability of interaction, because you would have to talk a little bit about quantum mechanics here, but what's happening is that you're probing the whole nucleus simultaneously, and then your probability of interaction, your cross-section, as we called it before, goes up with the square of the number of uh, nucleons in there. Actually, with the square of the number of neutrons, because of a little bit of a numerical conspiracy, the protons don't contribute so much. And you can see it here, we have the cross-section again in centimeter square. For neutrinos, this is small, 10 to the minus 40, as I told you. Cohen and Rhines, to discover the neutrino, they use this inverse beta decay mechanism, which generates ionizing particles and plenty signal. And uh, the big tanks that I showed you before use this other uh, scattering of electrons. You can see that we're three or two or three orders of magnitude higher. Then you may say, why, why did it take 43 years to, to see this thing? And why did this gentleman actually say, our suggestion may be an act of hubris because he thought it would be impossible. Well, because the only observable here is a low energy nuclear recoil. Now, what Daniel Friedman, the theoretician who proposed this mechanism was not counting on was 30 some years of working on developing the techniques that allow us to look uh, for WIMPs and being able to apply them to this other area, which is what we did. Um, let me see, I have 10 more minutes or a bit less. Um, so it was it was a bit of a, of a big deal, and and you know we 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 enjoyed uh, finally putting to work all of these techniques. In this case, to detect nuclear recoils coming from a particle that we know exists, rather than uh, one that might not. This there's no warranty that these wimps interact other than gravitationally. Okay, so everyone in our field has it very present. Those of us who are looking for dark matter, then maybe this will not pan out. But in this case, we were able to, to put that deep bag of tricks to work in this other area. Now, let's have a little bit of fun and I'm getting to the end of my talk. Sevens, this mechanism of uh, uh, neutrino interaction leading to low energy nuclear recoils um, has been welcome because in 43 years, theoreticians and phenomenologists had plenty of time to come up with applications. And, and some of those are in nuclear physics, some others are in particle physics where you can probe the properties of the neutrino that are still unknown in a new different fashion. So they, it has plenty of pure science applications, but it, it also has the appeal, the science fiction-y appeal of uh, the fact that you're using tiny miniature handheld neutrino detectors. In the interim, some people have fun predicting what this new type of detector might be good for. Leo Stodolsky and uh, Andrzej Drukier, they were, when I was a grad student, their papers were a great inspiration to me to, to try to pursue this area. Leo Stodolsky was asked during a conference uh, in the past century to uh, give a speech, after dinner speech on neutrino events of the 21st century. And right around 2020, he said, that's the advent, the arrival of the neutrino radio using sevens. <laughs> but he was very clear to say, it's a shame that we don't know how to build the emitter, okay? So it is true that in principle, you could think about using this for neutrino communications, but nobody knows how to generate a beam of neutrinos intense enough. I'm gonna show you something about that in a second uh, to, to produce a viable emitter. Uh, this is my own take on, the, on, the, on Leo's uh, neutrino radio. Uh, here's a pattern where this is a, a step closer to the what is feasible, which is maybe detect uh, nuclear submarines by sensing their neutrino emissions with a compact uh, sevens sensitive detector. Okay, there's an actual patent on that. Um, communications using neutrinos is not entirely crazy. We, we've actually been there and done that. It's been done with using big detectors and intense beams uh, to transmit at this warp speed of 0.1 bits per second 
a 1% bit error rate over a kilometer, the word neutrino. I would have gone for Mary had a little lamp being a, a bit more of a classicist myself. But um, um, it's been done. And there's papers out there that you can actually read from you know, perfectly respectable members of our community. John Learned, again, an inspiration to those of us who are a bit younger than him. Uh, this this, this uh, scientist who uh, actually uh, proposed some of the neutrino telescope, undersea neutrino telescopes we, we use nowadays to look for high energy cosmic neutrinos. There are some advantages in principle that could be claimed that uh, could be used, you know, that using neutrinos for communications. Clearly, it takes a very advanced civilization and we're still not there. These are very high energies that we cannot produce yet. But there's a low hanging fruit. There's a low hanging fruit, which is using compact neutrino detectors to monitor what's happening inside of a nuclear reactor. And tomorrow in my second talk, I will go into a little bit more uh, technical detail on this. This is my uh, grad student, Mark Lewis, for scale, to, pro to provide scale to the picture, standing next to a cylindrical wall. And you're starting to guess what's inside. Eight meters behind it, you have a three gigawatt uh, power reactor here in Illinois. We have the, you know, the, the, the good fortune of having nine cores running and more than 50% of our clean energy being produced using nuclear reactors. And this little package here, that little object there, and the little bit of electronics associated is actually in principle, a type of entirely different type of detector in this case, a germanium detector, very special, that can sense the very low energy recoil energies in this case that might be coming from the tremendous flux of neutrinos at this spot. This is actually a record flux. It's almost 10 to the 14 anti-neutrinos per square centimeter per second uh, where Mark is standing. Um, this is just essentially where we are with respect to the, to the core. And yes, that, that wall is very warm to the touch. And uh, when you have your back against it, it puts the fear of God into you. The, the, the core is eight meters. The center of the core is a bit more than eight meters right behind you. Uh, no Star Wars, but Star Trek. Coincidentally, the, this is a very special detector. I'll be talking about it tomorrow. Uh, coincidentally, Canberra, the manufacturer for the detector, gave it the serial number of 1701. And any Trekkie listening to me right now knows that's the, the the space fleet call number for the enterprise, NCC 1701. So hence the little toy uh, on top of it. NCC stands for Naval Construction, what is it? Naval Construction Contract in the original Star Trek lingo. In our case, it stands for Neutrino Coherent Coupling 1701, Bold Ligo, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, this, is the, this is actually my last few slides. Uh, what I want to convey with them is that nuclear recoils are an old shoe. They've been around for a long time, a hundred years or more. The uh, Joliet Curies were actually the first ones to produce them and, and then misinterpret their origin when they were thinking that those neutrons were high energy gammas. But we're still learning things about them. We, we do experiments using neutron sources very often, special neutron sources, trying to create nuclear recoils in specialized detectors, trying to understand how they respond to the nuclear recoils, because sometimes your detector only senses ionization. And, and these nuclear recoils are not very efficient, as you have seen before, in ionizing. They disperse the energy through these billiard ball collisions that at the end of the day amount to heat to just you know, uh, not, not necessarily the production of ionization. So we have to do all of these calibration experiments as we call them, that lead us to understand if you put a one kV nuclear recoil into your detector, how much energy are you going to sense in whatever it is that you're measuring scintillation, light, ionization, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, we, we, we go places, we spent three years recently in, in visiting two different uh, nuclear reactors and then actually bugging people in a third one to create the radioactive source that you see here, trying to create sub kV, sub kilo electron volt uh, nuclear recoils. And for instance, what this is a paper we just published a couple of months ago. It's about to appear uh, in a week or so. We see 
the way we've been understanding this response of detectors to nuclear recoils at these very low energies, we see it breaking down. This is a theory that dates back to the 1920s. The, the dotted line is what you would naively expect. And you can see that our data points in red, everything we measure with four different techniques points at the strong deviation. We don't know yet what produced this. We're very sure that we didn't make any mistakes, but these things do happen too. Maybe we made four mistakes in a row. There are all the theories that were forgotten for a long time uh, that are being revived that might be behind what I just showed you. In this case, coming from this gentleman called uh, Migdal, one of the academicians uh, in Russia, uh, who wonder about what happens when you give a little jolt to a nucleus, okay? Now, um, in quantum mechanics, you would use what is called perturbation theory to calculate this. And it's a process that has, has actually been seen in other systems. But uh, here we have a little cartoon of, of what might be going on. The neutron in our case, or dark matter particle, or neutrino, comes, kicks the nucleus. And then you can see that the electric or electronic orbitals are left behind. The, the nucleus starts to recoil and the orbitals are still wondering what's going on. This is happening in timescales of 10 to the minus 14 seconds. And then when the whole atom rearranges itself, the jolt as uh, Landau called it here, is such that you eject an electron and the electron produces a lot of ionization, a lot of signal that the detector would see, which might have led us to see this. The, the jury is still out. We don't know. Okay, but a hundred years later, we're still learning things about this nuclear recoils that uh, Chadwick uh, profited from. And uh, the last thing I want to show you, I'm going to just uh, explain what I just showed a minute ago with uh, something I can understand because I studied this book by Landau when I was in grad school and I have forgotten everything about it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not ashamed to tell you, uh, but this, this is a perturbation theory for us pedestrians. Here you have your nucleus, this gentleman here, holding an electron, okay? And here comes the perturbation. Here comes the nuclear recoil. Let's see. Boom, there's your electron, okay? So without any uh, further ado, this is what I wanted to discuss with you guys tonight. Thanks. <laughs>